Let us pray. O oh God, may the meditations of our hearts, everything that is on our mind, rest in your heart of grace and love on this day. And may we remember it and be touched by it in every way. Amen. This past week, I've been doing a lot of reflecting on the Eucharist communion. So part of most of what I will share with you this morning comes from my own personal journey around communion. What I can tell you is that for me, it plays a central role into how I define myself as a member of the Christian community. For me, it is deeply profound and mystical. In many ways, it's a protest, which I'll say something about after. However, as I was doing that, I was listening to an interview with Karen Armstrong, who I'm sure a good number of you might know, the great author, on her recent book, The Lost Art of Scripture, Rescuing the Sacred Texts. She's referring not just to Christian scripture, she's referring to all the texts around the world that come from various faith bodies. I caught something that she said that I believed helps to inform us this morning as we move into the depth of the mystery that we encounter through the sharing of communion every time we do. She said that she believes that we've lost something crucial, what she calls the art of Scripture. The power of Scripture is its potential, she says, to lift us out of the everyday and out of our ego-bound selves toward the transcendent mystery. End of quote. You see, I like to think that sacred speech has the transformational power irrespective of its meaning. And when we speak or hear it, we are ourselves transformed in the moment. Every moment. The transformational potential stems from the way sacred scriptures were and should be enacted Historically, you might not be aware, they were sung, they were chanted, they were danced to in a communal setting rather than simply read silently by ourselves. The goal of Scripture was not to indoctrinate anyone. It was to connect to something beyond ourselves, to reach a state of Ecstasis, not ecstasy in the way the term is used these days, but more in line with the ancient Greek meaning of moving beyond one's self. When I was a kid going to Kings Court United Church, which no longer exists in this city, raised there, and when I would go to church with my father and my mother some Sundays because Sunday school happened before church, and when communion was served, I always found it very strange, even as a young child. For me, it was an experience of a shot glass from a bar being passed around and a piece of bread. That's just how I kind of experienced it initially. But then as I grew over time, and then as I became engaged in the life of the Roman Catholic community with my wife, and I was welcomed to receive communion with open arms by the priest here at St. John's the Apostle, who had no problem with me coming forward to receive communion. He was a radical in his own way. It was at that time 
that I was profoundly moved by the business of having to get up out of my pew to walk forward and to be engaged with communion that way. It was an action that was asking something of me and inviting me to a place. And then over more time, as I studied theology and as I continued to grow and evolve, it became even profoundly richer. Now, I know some of you might say, well, why haven't we celebrated communion more often, Barry? I can't give you the answer to that. Every place has its own rhythms. But for me, I could celebrate communion every single day of my life, and it would never be too much. So let me share with you why. The Eucharist, I believe, is an encounter of the heart. The knowing presence through our available presence. In the Eucharist, we move beyond mere words or rational thought, and we go to that place where we don't talk about the mystery. We begin to chew on it. We must move, I believe, our knowing to the bodily, to the cellular, to the participant, and to the unitive level. And then when, we, then when we do so, we keep eating and we keep drinking the mystery until one day it dawns on us in an undefended moment, my God, I am really what I eat. At his Last Supper, which might also have been the Jewish Passover meal, Jesus, in fact, gave us in the Christian community an action it's a mime of sorts, a sacred ritual for his community that would summarize his core and lasting message for our world. You also should take your full life in your hands. In very physical and scandalously incarnational language, table bread is daringly called my body. And wine is called my blood. You see, when you take it, you are saying a radical yes to both the physical universe itself and the bloody suffering of your own life in this world. And during that time, we thank the Holy One, Eucharistio in Greek, who is the origin of all life and who allows and uses the death that life includes. And we choose to break life and death wide open in the moment you let your life be broken, used up, and you don't spend your life protecting yourself and handing over the small self you discover, you see true self in God. There's that line in Scripture, remember? Unless the single grain of wheat dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. In the action of communion, we take, we eat, we drink, we chew, Ah, but that's not it. Because we are invited to a place that will take us in other directions. Some we might not want to go if we're living incarnationally. The incarnation mystery is repeated and represented in this Eucharist. In it we have material reality as the hiding place and the revelation place of the Holy One. This is the cosmic Christ experience more simply than just a Jesus experience. It's profound. 
It's a protest. For me, the Eucharist is an act of memory making. And it invites me, as it does all of us, to remember. It's a protest that I won't forget who I belong to. That I won't forget to say I am called to brokenness every single day of my life. That I won't forget that my blood itself must be poured out for others in our world daily. The memory that we encounter is that I do not do this on my own, but that I do this with others. It reminds me that I belong to a body and that I belong to the body of Christ around the world. It connects me and reminds me of the Roman Empire who brutalized and poured the blood of people onto the earth. Who brutalized this one known as Jesus as his blood poured out. But it also connects me to hope. Because in the middle of the Eucharist, we are reminded of the resurrection. We do this because this is not, I believe, the end of the story. We do this because it invites us to a deeper story that continues to evolve. It never stays the same. This Eucharist is a Eucharistic protest that invites us to become the bread, to become the wine for each other and every person we encounter in this world. Take, eat, drink, do. When we take the Eucharist, we are to become this bread and wine for each other and everyone in our world in the way we live our lives daily with each other. Remembering this action is a protest against all that is wrong in our lives and our world. You and I are called through the Eucharist to become the very body of Christ. To breathe it out every moment, in every second in time, in our daily lives. That's the danger when you take the Eucharist. It's not a safe place. It's a risky place of protest. So I say to you on this day, let's come. Let's eat. Let's chew. Let's become the realm of great love. May it be so for you, and may it be so.